Welcome to Electro Online. So here's the last part, part three, of what happens in the last few moments of a giant red, or of a super red giant in its last phases, the last moment of its life before it turns into a type two supernova. As we remember, the core is collapsing, the density is increasing, the electron degeneracy can no longer stop it. The core is now filled primarily with neutrons, and you can see that the density increases from 10 to the 15 to 10 to the 18 kilograms per cubic meter, which is even more dense than the nucleus of an atom, which is about 2 times 10 to the 17 kilograms per cubic meter. Essentially, the nuclear ball has been pressed, compressed to a density greater than its normal static density. It's basically like a ball that's being compressed and that will re-decompress as it tries to get back to its normal density. So, what holds this final collapse? It's called the degenerate neutron pressure that holds the collapse. So, what is the degenerate neutron pressure? Well, it turns out that neutrons are made out of three quarks. It has an up quark and two down quarks. Notice the up quark has a minus two-thirds charge and the down quarks each have a plus one-third charge. So, together, that is a neutral particle called a neutron. Now, there's something interesting about the quarks. The quarks have interesting forces between them. You cannot push the quarks closer together because they will push back. You can't pull the, the quarks farther apart because they pull back together. There seems to be those two opposing forces inside a neutron that hold the neutron in its shape. Now, at the time that the density has increased to the density of a nuclear ball, the core has a diameter of about 20 kilometers, about 12 miles. A single teaspoonful of this material, of this nuclear material, has a mass of 100 million tons. Imagine a small little teaspoonful having a mass of 100 million tons. Imagine the enormous pressure at the very center of this nuclear ball. The gravitational forces there would be absolutely unbelievable. And notice that this is a ball of neutrons. And at the very center of that, we have this arrangement of neutrons that are held together by three quarks, one up, two down quarks, and imagine the pressure at the center preventing those quarks or trying to push those quarks together, and somehow they're not capable of doing that. It's unbelievable that, 12, that six miles down, 10 kilometers down in a nuclear ball that has that incredible density, the quarks can withstand that enormous pressure. And that's what we call the degenerate neutron pressure, the neutrons prevent any further collapse, but it overshoots the density. It starts shooting back, which sends a shock wave through the star back outwards. Now we used to assume that this shock wave is what caused the, the uh, what we call the uh, type two supernova. But we don't think that's the case anymore because we calculate that that shock wave does not have enough energy to rip the star apart. It's not enough. So what is it that causes that type 2 supernova in which such enormous energy is deposited where all the elements of the periodic table are formed all the way up to plutonium, uranium, and so forth? Hmm. It turns out that it was the neutrinos that were created when the neutrons and the when the protons, electrons were pushed together into neutrons, in each case for every conversion like that, producing one single neutrino. neutrino. So many neutrinos, neutrinos were formed, not all of them were able to get out of the star because at this point the density was so enormous that not every neutrino was able to get out. A small percentage of them, which was still an enormous quantity of neutrinos, would interact with the matter, would actually bounce into the, the, nuclei, the nucleus material, and therefore it would, they would get absorbed. And that absorption would cause an enormous increase in temperature, that increase in temperature would create massive bubbles, superheated bubbles of gas around the core, and those superheated bu uh, bubbles of gas would expand enormously fast and thus pushing out violently, explosion-like, the rest of the layers of the star, where then all you would have left is that ball at the very center, that collapsed core that's 20, 20 kilometers across, made out of dense nuclear material, primarily neutrons, and the rest of the material of the star would get exploded outward from those expanding bubbles, those bubbles that absorbed that small percentage of neutrinos that caused them to heat up to enormous temperatures, pushing out all the material in a violent explosion. So, in that explosion is where all the material was built, 
that's now on the periodic table. All the elements heavier than iron are produced in that supernova explosion. All other elements between hydrogen and helium and iron are produced in that supernova explosion. It seeded the nebulas that were created from the explosion, what we call the supernova remnants, with all the material in the periodic table. When those nebulas then joined with other nebulas that then formed new stars, those stars were then able to form planetary nebulas, or not planetary nebulas, but material around the forming star that eventually would turn into planets, yes, terrestrial planets like the Earth, which was formed by one of those supernova explosions. In other words, the material that makes up the Earth, that makes up our bodies, that makes up everything we see around us, was created during that massive explosion about four and a half billion years ago, seeding the nebula from which our Sun and our planets were made with all the material necessary to make terrestrial planets and us. And that's why this whole process was started with the fact that iron could not be fused beyond iron or energy would be absorbed, causing the star core to collapse, ensuing the set of events that eventually resulted in the material from that massive explosion. And that is how it works. It's a happy ending? It's a wonderful ending. We're here because of that. <laughs> Can be all bad.